Okay, I'm the man of ex-Mormon. <laughs> As Richard said, I'm, I'm from Montgomery, Alabama, the youngest of 12 children, six boys, six girls. My Mormon mother married my non-Mormon father in 1937, and they were married for 53 years until his death in 1990. My father was basically irreligious, and he declined to join the LDS Church in spite of my mother's lifelong efforts. When I was young, our family only attended church sporadically. Uh, by my high school years, I, I didn't care for much for church, being more interested in like car sports, and girls like most other guys. But I graduated from high school and got a job, and my, my school friends and I went our separate ways. Thus, I lost my social group, so I went back to church to, to regain one. It's kind of lonely. Well, after a few months of going to church, I got religion and became all fired up about the church. I started reading things like the Grand Richard's Marvelous Work and Wonder and Gordon B. Hinckley, <coughs> Truth Restored. The next logical step was to go on a mission, so I put in my application and got sent to Brisbane, Australia. Uh, another person I didn't mention, Simon Southerton, for you guys that haven't heard, he was two or three years ago was the bishop of one of the wards I was a missionary in, in Brisbane in 1975. But having matured somewhat since I was 19 years old, I, I now realize that uh, one of my subconscious motives for going on a mission was to get away from my abusive, controlling father and domineering, manipulating mother. And at least that worked. <laughs> My mission was a generally good experience, although a few things happened there which later caused me to begin questioning the system. The most memorable incident involved one of my fellow greedy missionaries who was the son of a judge uh, down in Provo. Uh, just a few weeks after we'd arrived in Brisbane, uh, I heard from other missionaries that the guy and his trainer, who was an Australian convert, had, had met with some people who had shared some of the Tanner's material with them. Uh, although I didn't learn the details till later, the gist of the incident was that both the trainer and the greenie had allegedly you know, lost their testimonies. The trainer was busted back down to Junior Companion and the mission president put the greenie on his office staff so he could keep an eye on it. Towards the end of our missions, we were in the same district together and I asked him a little about the incident. And he was reluctant to share much about it, but uh, he did let on that the these anti-Mormons they met had, had told them about how the Book of Mormon, uh, excuse me, Book of Abraham, could not have come from the Egyptian papyrus Joseph Smith claimed it did. The missionary told me that our mission president explained to him that uh, uh, ancient Egyptian was a dead language and couldn't be translated, so therefore no one could dispute Joseph Smith's interpretations. Of course, being 20 years old at the time and never having heard of the Rosetta Stone or Egyptology or anything, I assumed that our mission president's remarks were truthful and accurate. I now realize that he just made up those remarks to quiet the missionaries' doubts and to keep them on their missions, which is done every day in some mission throughout the world, I suppose. Being a naive, trusting young TBM, I buried that incident in the back of my mind. I had a largely good and productive mission, and I came home ready to devote the rest of my life to the church. Two weeks after I returned home, I was made a counselor in the Elders Board Presidency, which assured me that I would become a general authority by age 30. <laughs> when I was 23 and still single, I was made a ward clerk, which caused me to believe that I'd surely achieve apostle level by no later than my 40th birthday. <laughs> My wife, Cari, and I met in 78, married in 79. We began having babies and living our lives as good little Mobots. <laughs> Cari served in all the women's groups, and I was ward clerk in three different wards, as Richard mentioned, under six different bishops, counselor to five elders quorum presidents, elders quorum president myself for a year, young men's president, ward mission leader, and finally I was a bishop's counselor for two years. I served in ward leadership positions for almost 13 straight years from 76 to 89 and also worked extensively on the state welfare farm and helped build several chapels over the years and all service projects, the, the usual things. So what was it that caused us to begin to question the church? Well, for starters, maybe it was that 13 straight years of leadership positions. That's <laughs> <laughs> most people. You know, I've never taken the time to write our story of leaving the church to put on the Exmoor website. So perhaps my remarks, some of my remarks here, and I can serve to do that. 
but our questions and doubts were among the same ones that many of you have had, and I'll briefly touch on some of the, the major ones that helped us to see the light as my experiences tie into the subject of my talk. Uh, I forgot to mention my sister Rose, who's here also. She's a new ex -mom. My oldest brother, our oldest brother Jimmy, married a Baptist girl in the late 50s, and he converted to her faith, so he was excommunicated from the LDS Church for uh, apostasy. As Sandra, the, he's in good company with Tanner's. My brother was the first person I'd ever known that left the church, and of course it upset my TBM mother terribly. Jimmy and his wife had taught their children a little about the dubious origins of Mormonism. When I was 22 or so and a recently returned missionary, Jimmy's teenage daughter tried to tell me about Joseph Smith being a money digger, but I arrogantly brushed her off telling her that I was a Mormon and a returned missionary and therefore she couldn't possibly know more than I did about Joseph Smith. <laughs> of course, I'd never heard anything about money digging from church approved sources, so therefore it must be false, right? So there was another incident that I buried in the back of my mind to be brought up later. Uh, my wife, Carrie, had been raised in rural Protestant churches. She and her best friend had joined the LDS church together as teenagers, largely because of the, the church's family image, the Osmonds, etc. <laughs> the old joke is a lot, of, a lot of girls in the 70s weren't baptized, they were Osmondized. <laughs> she doesn't like me to say that, so that's why I say it. <laughs> But shortly after the join, Cardi's friend began reading books like Discourses of Brigham Young, Doctrines of Salvation by Joseph Fielding Smith, Mormon Doctrine by Bruce R. McConkie, which contained material on some of the, the deep, dark doctrines like Jesus being married, polygamy, God having sex with Mary to conceive Jesus, the Negro issue, etc. And Cardi would ask me about some of those teachings, but I would just brush her off and explain them away with, well, that was just those guys' opinions, or that's not essential to your salvation, or... We'll find that out someday, the usual put-off, which is what we hear from Mormon apologists on the internet now. Although I pushed those things to the back of my mind at the time, what really got me questioning the church's validity was our own negative personal experiences. To touch on a few, uh, Kari and I decided to get married civilly rather than in the temple. <coughs> she had not been a member for a year yet, and so her non-Mormon family could attend our wedding. And then we, we were going to go get sealed four months later after she'd been a member for a year. When we informed our bishop of our plans, now this guy had spent four years at BYU and he'd been in a stake institute director for eight years. Uh, you know, we sat in talk talked with him. He replied, and these are his exact words, which we'll never forget. I want to counsel you to not consummate your marriage until after you've been sealed at the table. <laughs> so that your children will be conceived in the couple. It's not in the mind and will of the Lord for the church leaders to lead us astray. <laughs> well, you know, I've heard everybody else's crazy stories about the church leaders, and this was one of our biggies. Well, we were so taken aback with his counsel that we couldn't come up with a response, so we just kind of muttered something, well, we'll think about it. <laughs> what he thought we were supposed to do for the first four months of our marriage, I don't know, read the Book of Mormon, I guess. <laughs> since learned that the bishop's counsel was merely following Joseph Smith's revelation on celestial marriage, which says that you weren't really married in the eyes of God until you were sealed in the temple in the everlasting covenant. That incident gave us first-hand experience with the way some church leaders try to manip manipulate members' emotions and control the most intimate reaches of their private lives. Another big experience occurred when I was 27 and a war clerk. We had a really good bishop who was transferred away in his job. The new guy they called his bishop was, was a man I just had a really bad feeling about. Uh, he hadn't said or done any specific thing that caused me to have those negative feelings, but you know how you sometimes just have intuition or hunches about certain people. I felt so negatively about this guy that when he was announced as bishop, I was sitting at the clerk's table up front, 
and I didn't raise my arm to sustain it. I just pretended that I was writing something and nobody noticed me not raising my arm. I made up my mind that I'd give him six months to see if I felt better about him, but I never did. And about the same time, I got a job offer in Tennessee and we were looking for greener pastures anyhow, so I resigned as ward clerk and we moved. And a few months later, we heard from a friend in our former ward that the bishop had been excommunicated. We later learned that he had been having an affair with a young, pretty woman whom he had called his Relief Society president, who uh -huh. lived just down the block from him, <coughs> and whose husband was working out of the country at the time. The bishop didn't confess the affair to state leaders. The woman did out of her own guilt, so he was forced to admit to it. So they were both excommunicated. Now, those events alone confirm my negative intuition about the guy, but there are a couple of postscripts to the story. First, we learned a couple of years later that the bishop had also been molesting a teenage babysitter during the same period. He didn't confess to that, and the girl didn't tell anybody, so he was never punished or prosecuted for that crime. He supposedly repented of the affair with the woman, and he was rebaptized without ever confessing to the molestation. We later learned that the girl grew up to have four children by three different fathers. Secondly, the state president who handled that case was himself later excommunicated. Uh, we heard it through the grapevine that for having an affair with his secretary. When I heard that, my first thought was, was the state president having an affair with his secretary during the same time when he was <laughs> excommunicating other people for adultery? <laughs> Well, you know, as Mormons, we were all taught that leaders are called by inspiration. And bishops and state presidents and all are called to those positions because they're who the Lord wants there at that time for that particular purpose and all that. But those incidents were some of the biggies that caused me to begin questioning the inspiration of the church as an institution. <coughs> We've all heard that the gospel is perfect, but the people aren't. But if high leaders are supposed to be called of God through the prophet, it should follow that revelation should supposedly prevent people who, who have immoral leanings from being called to those positions. That incident made me ask, you know, if I have negative intuition about the new bishop, then why couldn't other ward or state leaders feel that too? And even before he was called as bishop. Am I the only one who had the, the power of discernment to know that the guy was likely to, to go that way? And those events helped me to realize that the whole power of discernment of business was a shame. Another big negative experience for me was the Mark Hoffman scandal. I was a 27-year-old Elders Corps president when the Church News and Ensign began publishing the wonderful new discoveries which helped to prove that the Joseph Smith story was really true. I even departed from my regular priesthood lesson one Sunday to talk about the newly discovered 1828 letter from Lucy Mack Smith to a relative where she talked about the angel and the gold plates which prove to the anti-Mormon world that Joseph Smith really was having those visions in the 1820s rather than being a peep stone and fraud artist as his critics had alleged. But then shortly after that came the Salamander Letter, which once again cast Joseph Smith as an occultist. And then came the spin doctoring from the church's apologist, who said that Salamander was a quaint term that also meant heavily messenger. <laughs> 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 Frogs had wings. <laughs> Even as a trusting, gullible TVM at the time, you know, that explanation bothered me just a little. And then came the bombings, the murders, church leaders scrambling and backpedaling, and the ensuing scandal. So once again, I was asking myself, where's the inspiration? By 1989, I was a bishop's counselor, and I was so bothered by those types of issues as well as by the politics and hypocrisy I experienced in, in our war that I resigned. I never accepted another significant calling after that, although we still attended church most of the time and Kari continued to serve in positions. Then in 1990 came another blow to my testimony when church leaders made the changes in the temple endowment ceremony. For me, the, the changes weren't as big as an issue as the fact that when I went through the Salt Lake Temple here in 1974, our group of missionaries was taken to the big ornate upstairs assembly room where we had a question and answer session with one of the general authorities whose name was O. Leslie Stone, if you remember that name. One of the missionaries asked him if the endowment ceremony had ever been changed and uh, Stone replied emphatically that it had not. 
and that church leaders kept the original scripts of the ceremony to ensure that it was repeated correctly, you know, giving us the impression that it was like the sacrament prayers and baptismal prayers are, are maintained and required to be repeated verbatim. In other words, we assume that the endowment ceremony we went through is just like Joseph Smith received it by revelation in 1844. So when I learned of the 1990 changes, my mind immediately went back to Stone's emphatic remarks to us naive missionaries 16 years earlier about the accuracy and unchangeability of the ceremony. Of course, I've since learned that the ceremony has undergone numerous significant alterations since its 1842 inception, and that those changes, including the 1990 ones, were made because of political or social correctness issues rather than out of doctrinal need. That was my first personal experience with a general authority being less than totally honest about the facts of church history. The promise in the DNC that church leaders would never lead us astray was beginning to unravel. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> In the South, we don't hear much news about the LDS Church other than what we get from church publications. But in 1993, I read a short review in the religion section of my local paper about a new book called New Approaches to the Book of Mormon. The book, written by Mormons rather than so-called anti-Mormons, advocated the concept that the Book of Mormon was not an authentic literal history, but was rather a product of the 19th century, but which still had value as inspired writings. Reading that review shocked me because I'd never before heard of any church members disputing or denying the historicity of the Book of Mormon. Like most of us here, I assumed that the Book of Mormon was authentic and that archaeological evidence you know, settled the issue years before. I'd never personally done any serious research on the subject, like 98% of all Mormons. I just accepted the works of church scholars like Milton Roberts, Jack West, Hugh Nibley, John Sorensen, on the Book of Mormon as being the gospel truth. I believe that all people who challenged the authenticity of the Book of Mormon were anti-Mormons who were the minions of Satan out to destroy the church. But when I read that faithful church members were challenging the Book of Mormon's historicity, that was a revelation I couldn't shove to the back of my mind <coughs> as I had other previous issues. <clears throat> then several other things happened in quick succession which created a snowball effect on my belief in the church. Uh, in my local public library, I happened across the books The Mormon Murders and A Gathering of Saints, which detailed the Mark Hoffman incident. I was sickened to read of church leaders' closed-door deals to acquire potentially damaging historical documents and put them where they would never see the light of day, as the saying went. All the maneuvering seemed more like what a giant corporation would engage in to protect its market position rather than what leaders of a Christian church should do as part of ministry to their flock. I was uh, disgusted to learn how Hoffman had uh, hobnobbed with the highest church leaders, earned their trust, and how he completely snookered them and made a mockery of their supposed powers of discernment. Then also in 1993, I read how several high-profile church scholars were excommunicated because they wrote or stated things which allegedly contradicted the church teachings. And that incident made me think, what, what in the heck is going on here? What did all these scholars say or write that was so awful that church leaders felt the need to kick them out? Those, I didn't intend to, we didn't know any details. We just read a tiny little article in the paper. We didn't know any details. We, we're all in the dark over those stupid. <laughs> those excommunications of the so called September 6th reminded me of the purges of intellectuals which have occurred in totalitarian regimes like the Soviet Union. I began to realize that there's something seriously wrong with an organization that claims to advocate the concept of free agency, but then censors or excommunicates its members for merely expressing contrary or unorthodox opinions. Then on the heels of that came the fall from grace of General Authorities George P. Lee and Paul H. Dunn. Like thousands of other young Mormons in the 70s, I have enjoyed tapes of Dunn's inspirational speeches and I thought that he must have been superhuman and protected by God to have survived all those ordeals. <laughs> and in 1996, I read of how Dunn had wildly exaggerated or invented many of the experiences and 
how he was basically put out to pasture as a 70 emeritus. Dunn's folksy storytelling style, <clears throat> excuse me, during a moment of twisted humor, I combined his folksy storytelling style with his embarrassing fall from grace in a ditty I wrote, which, uh, a ditty I wrote, so with apologies to uh, Paul Henning of the Beverly Hillbillies, I present <laughs> Ballad of Paul H. Dunn. <laughs> This is the humor part. <laughs> Come and listen to my story about a man named Paul. A man who said he'd done things he hadn't done at all. Then some reporter wrote it up in the news and old Paul done come out of Babylon food. Four <laughs> heroes instead. Major League Baseball star. <laughs> well, the first thing you know, old Paul is out of there. He clearly told him, get your butt off Temple Square. A 70 emeritus is what you ought to be, rethinking and rewriting your personal history. <laughs> Fuck private, that is. Minor League washout. <laughs> then after Mr. Dunn died a couple years ago, I, I wrote a postscript to the ballot. Well, now it's time to say goodbye to this authority. Old Paul has gone and left us for the spirit world, you see. He'll preach the gospel there so all those dead guys can believe. And they can be good Mormons too for all eternity. <laughs> I have to believe that the years from about 1985 to 1993 might have been the very worst terms of uh, PR for the church with all those negative incidents coming in seeming waves and I wonder just how many thousands of Mormons left the church over some or all of those incidents as we did. In 1996 I discovered internet articles and forums which discuss Mormonism including the ex-Mormon email group. Prior to that I had no idea that any such places existed where people could discuss things and ask questions about topics which were taboo in church settings. I was pleasantly surprised to learn that the man who ran the Recovery from Mormon website, Eric Ketnan, lives just 100 miles down the road from us. We all owe a huge debt of gratitude to Eric for taking his time and energy to <laughs> for taking his time and energy to implement and maintain a site where we can discuss our experiences and feelings and ask questions about Mormonism where no church authorities can invade and try to control the dialogue. I called Eric up and we talked for an hour or two the very first time and we've had to be together since. I also subscribed to and began posting on the Mormons in Transition and the Free Saints internet forums. I think that Brian Madsen here may be the only one here in this room who posted on the Free Saints forum when I did around 97, 98. Anybody else? Free Saints. During that time, I began to learn a lot more about Mormon origins and Joseph Smith's life. I was particularly disheartened to learn that Smith had been plural married to girls as young as 14. Uh, one day, I made an offhand sarcastic comment on the Free Saints forum about Smith's affair with the 14-year-old Fanny Alger, and the response I got to that comment was what inspired me to begin a serious study of Mormon history. One of the posters on Free Saints was an institute instructor here at the University of Utah, and I, I assume he still is. He replied to me that Fanny Alger was 16, not 14, <laughs> when she was plural married to Smith, and therefore my error gave me, in his words, the credibility of a peeled zero. <laughs> well, I knew that I'd read about Smith and a 14-year-old girl somewhere, so I looked it up and found that the girl wasn't Fanny Alger, but was instead Helen Mark Kimball, the daughter of Heber C. Kimball. Being new to matters of Mormon history, I simply confused the two girls and their ages when writing about it from memory. But that incident gave me my first exposure <coughs> to the creature known as the Mormon Apologist. <laughs> you know, at that time, my family and I were still semi-active in church. The stereotypical image of a Mormon leader or scholar is supposed to be, you know, friendly, helpful, missionary-minded, and so forth, but that guy's unnecessarily hostile response to my honest mistake on a trivial point uh, contradicted that image. What was disturbing to me was not being wrong on this minor point, but 
rather that a person who apparently knew details about Joseph Smith's relationships with teenage girls was still an active Mormon and institute director. Like most other naive Mormons, I believe that rumors of Joseph Smith's extramarital affairs were just anti-Mormon lies told to destroy Joseph's reputation. When I first began learning the facts about those affairs, I was disgusted and I came to realize that Smith was a lecherous fraud and perhaps a sexual predator. But here was an active, believing Mormon who knew about those relationships and yet it apparently didn't bother him in the least. Well, having been raised with morals, I wrongly assumed that any church member who discovered the facts about Smith's sexual habits would surely question the church or consider abandoning it. But those facts apparently didn't faze this guy. Of course, now I've learn pretty much everything there is to know about Joseph Smith's relationships with 30 to 50 different women. I was disheartened to learn of his unsuccessful attempts to seduce such young women as Helen Kimball, Martha Brotherton, who was a convert just in from England, and Nancy Rigdon, who was the 19-year-old daughter of Sidney Rigdon. You know, sometimes you hear of situations that are so despicable that you can't help but make them the object of humor or satire. I thought to myself, you know, what thoughts must have gone through the mind of the average teenage Mormon girl of Nauvoo of 1842 upon hearing of Joseph Smith's revelation on celestial marriage and his claim that an angel with a flaming sword had commanded him to enter plural marriage. And those thoughts inspired me to write another sarcastic ditty which I call Lament of a Young Nauvoo Girl. <laughs> You might know the tune. <laughs> I looked out the window and what did I see? Prophet Joseph making eyes at me. It shouldn't come as a complete surprise. The angel told him, try her own first sight. <laughs> now I could take a powder and leave the scene, but he probably soon poured her to take care of me. <laughs> I guess it must be so, but I don't want to be the prophet's wife number 33. <laughs> You're too kind. <laughs> or you can come back out from under the table now. <laughs> The institute director with whom I debated later boasted he, that he'd been studying anti-Mormon claims for 20 years and that he'd never found a single one that he couldn't reconcile in his mind. Of course, I now realize that his boast wasn't a statement of fact, but was instead the workings of what uh, Steve Lowther here has termed the Mormon Denial Mechanism, or MDM. <laughs> the Mormon Denial Mechanism works like this. Whenever a TBM is presented with any information which challenges his preconceived notions about Mormon history or teachings, he simply rejects all sources of contrary information until the only sources he's left with are those which support his preconceived notions. Of course, that activity is nothing more than self-deception, or I've also compared it to the uh, syndrome of jury nullification that we learned about in the O.J. Simpson case where uh, jury members that are biased will just ignore all evidence which contradicts, you know, the way they want the case to turn out. What that arrogant institute instructor didn't realize is that his nasty, condescending response not only helped to push me further out of the church, he also unwittingly inspired me to make a lifelong hobby of researching Mormon origins and history. I made it my goal to study Mormonism to the point that there were no issues that I couldn't address, no question I couldn't offer comment on, and no claims of apologists that I couldn't refute with documentation from legitimate scholarly sources. Having satisfied myself that Mormonism was a fraud, I decided to devote the same level of time and energy into exposing it that I had put into advocating it, minus the paying 10% of my income for life and the privilege of doing so. That. And, uh, you know, lots of people, as I've read on the forums over the years. A lot of people who leave the church want to get rid of all the books and things which deal with Mormonism or remind them of the church. But I realized that if I was going to be some sort of become some sort of a, you know, 
knowledgeable of things concerning Mormonism, but I needed to keep all that material. Uh, the knee-jerk reaction of most Mormons is to reject any negative information as being anti-Mormon literature. So I knew that I needed to research and quote material from pro-Mormon sources. The fact is that some of the best anti-Mormon material ever published is some of those old books and magazines. I kept the old Improvement Eras and Ensign magazines from back in the early 60s. I raided my elderly mother's bookshelves for old books she no longer reads. And uh, I've even visited used bookstores. Even in Tennessee, I've been able to find a lot of good books on Mormonism. And I brought a few of my books that some of you guys can look at if you like afterwards. Most of you be familiar with some of them. This is, you know, interpolated it back into the history. And, and Lamar Peterson shows how, you know, there was never any actual evidence that the Peter, James, and John visit ever occurred. Hey, Lamar Peterson went to school with the people. They were here. Yeah, you know, just a little trivia thing. Yeah, who rubbed off on whom? <laughs> Uh, this is Todd Compton's In Sacred Loneliness, Florida Wise of Joseph Smith. You can see I've done a little, <laughs> little bit of work in there. Um, this is a uh, LDS scholar, uh, Dean Jesse's uh, The Papers of Joseph Smith, Volume 2. I brought it because, uh, you know, Joseph Smith denied that he was uh, the instigator of the Danite Society in Missouri in, in uh, 1838. But Dean Jesse has got Joseph Smith's actual papers here. And uh, one journal entry there in uh, 1838 is where Joseph Smith is uh, remarking about we have a company of Danites in these times to put right things physically which are not right in the church. And of course when he was arrested in the far west that following October he denied all responsibility for the Danites. Uh, tried to slew him off on a, an underling named Samson Avard. And it's good to see that even some church scholars are, you know, uh, restoring uh, journal entries to their original state. And to have church published sources, uh, Deseret Book published, that you can share with Mormon apologists and say, look, this is from your own stuff. See, this is not from the Tanners or, you know, anybody else, any anti-Mormons. This really? is from your own scholars. That, if that book is no longer in print, is it? I have no idea. Jake, get mine. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Where, I mean, what kind of a, that's that's a treasure. I don't know if Sandra would know more about it than I do. It's a fairly recent book, and I can't imagine you not being able to get a really? copy. It's copyright 1992, Corporation of the President. All right. So look around. Some of these used bookstores, you yeah. know. And then here's one I got from my mother's shelves, the Lucy Max Smith's History of Joseph Smith, which is, of course, the revision, but it's the 1958 Bookcraft edition. Uh, B.H. Roberts, The Rise and Fall of Nauvoo. A uh, little one here that not too many of these are around. Mormonism and the Negro by John J. Stewart, which features Brigham Young's prophecy that the Negroes wouldn't get the priesthood until the millennium. All that good stuff. Uh, Calgary Davis and Scales, uh, I think 1977, who really wrote the Book of Mormon? This started opening my eyes to the uh, fact that the whole story that Mormon apologists tell about Philastus Hurlburt made up all these affidavits about Joseph Smith's uh, peak stoning and money digging in 1833. This opened my eyes to the fact that uh, all that was known about two and three years before that. And of course, Dale Broadhurst has done tons more research on, along those lines, along with some other scholars. Found me a 1920 copy of the Book of Mormon. Not really. Where'd you get that? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Cheryl B. Christian Center. Christmas 1920. Used bookstores, different places. This one here is, is one of my favorites. This is uh, The Story of the Pearl of Great Price by James R. Clark, who was a former pre vice president of BYU, Sandra, I know is very familiar with this book and, and this author. Some, a couple of the most interesting things about it, it's all about you know, the book of Abraham, book of Moses, and all that. And a lot of the uh, uh, arguments that Mormon apologists make to support the book of, Mormon, uh, of Abraham were actually uh, contradicted by <coughs> Vice President Clark said in his book years ago. 
for instance, the uh, argument that uh, we still don't have the, you know, papyrus that Joseph Smith actually translated the Book of Abraham from. Well, Mr. Clark uh, furnished a couple of photocopies of a uh, an advertising sideboard written by an early Egyptologist, one of Gustavus Gustavus Seyfarth from, I believe, 1859, 1860, which described the papyrus and the descriptions of them match the papyrus that was donated back to the church from the Metropolitan Museum in 67 or whenever it was. So it basically destroys uh, the Mormons' argument that we still don't have the source material. This one here is another funny one. I, if I'd had time, I would have blown some of this up. But this is a copy of a letter from Joseph Fielding Smith to Brother Clark. Now, James R. Clark was an associate with uh, the late Sidney B. Sperry, if you recall that name. They worked on these ancient documents, Joseph Smith's Egyptian alphabet, grammar, and things having to do with the book of Abraham and all that for years. Well, Joseph Fielding Smith found somewhere uh, or another a... Uh, a picture of an old Egyptian glyph and Joseph Fielding Smith thought that this glyph depicted uh, the, the serpent giving Eve the apple in the Garden of Eden. But what Joseph Fielding Smith was too uh, ignorant to know <laughs> is that this is, was a very typical scene in Egyptology in the funerary you know, rites. And the funniest thing, the big, biggest kick I get out of it, either Joseph Fielding Smith or somebody who copied this, uh, if any of you are familiar with the Egyptolog <laughs> Egyptological issues at all and familiar with the, uh, the significance of the erect penis in uh, mummification, etc., uh, this, this picture here is actually not a female Eve as Joseph Fielding Smith thought, but it's a male. But right about his groin area is about an eighth of an inch line that is just missing. There's just nothing there. They have castrated this poor, <laughs> this poor God. And I don't know if it's Joseph Fielding Smith or wherever he got it from, but somebody removed this poor man's organ <laughs> in order to try to make it appear that it depicted the serpent giving the apple to eat. You might want to take a peek at that. I also have a very old copy of uh, Harley P. Pratt's Voice of Warning, 1895. Uh, Fawn Brody's No Man Knows My History, which should be in every anti Warren's collection. Uh, you know, this was one of Joseph Smith's few fulfilled prophecies. No man knows my history. It took a woman. Then <laughs> uh, other books such as Jan Ship's book on Mormonism and uh, former BYU professor Richard Bushman's uh, book Joseph Smith and the Beginnings of Mormonism. This is very uh, valuable to me because it is a BYU professor who tells all about Joseph Smith's money digging and peep stoning. You know these mobots on the internet. Deny that it ever happened. Anyway, that's the kind of stuff I've collected over the years. Oh, a couple other things. Uh, my dear mother, TBM, 86 years old, still keeps me a subscription to the Ensign. I rarely read them. Sometimes I'll thumb through them, and I just brought these because these are recent uh, editions. Uh, one of them features an article on the ministry of Joseph Smith, and the other one on the ministry of Brigham Young. And neither article so much mentions so much as one word about polygamy. polygamy. Not a single word. The ministry of Joseph Smith, not one word about polygamy. It's just an example of how the church is trying to forget all about their uh, history of polygamy. I later unsubscribed from the Free Saints and Mormons in Transition groups because of time constraints. And I began dialoguing more on the Alt Religion Mormon news group because it has a larger number of subscribers and a greater cross section of posters from varying backgrounds. As I began researching and posting my findings, I decided to forward 
post a dialogue from ARM to ExMormon and other groups so that I could reach a wider audience and to keep from having to constantly repeat the same material to different forums. In December of 1998, Kari and I decided to resign our church memberships. Old timers here are familiar with the ordeal we went through in resigning where our state president tried to excommunicate me three months after we sent in our letters of resignation. I won't bore all of you with the details of that again, but I brought copies of all the correspondence here that's taped up on the wall that you can look over if you like. It's in chronological order that shows from the original letter I wrote to the bishop and state president to our final letter where, where we uh, received our confirmation name removal. Early in my readings about Mormonism on the internet, I came across a statement that really influenced me. I can't even remember the exact statement or where I read it. It may be from one of the ex-Mormon stories, even from one of you here, for all I know. But the statement was talking about faith, and it said something to the effect of, faith can do a lot of things for us. Faith can help us through bad times in life and help us to go on living. But one, one thing faith cannot do is alter facts. That statement hit me like a ton of bricks. I thought to myself, you know, that's what the church asks its members to do. It asks us to believe in the concept that faith can alter facts. Facts of history, facts of science, facts of time and space. If facts of history or science, etc. contradict our faith, the church expects us to ignore or deny facts and live by faith. Or in other words, to suspend disbelief. It shortly dawned on me that that is exactly what magicians and con artists do. They need their audiences or their dupes to suspend disbelief, ignore facts, and instead rely completely on faith for their truth. You know, we have a saying down south about people who are trying to con us. The saying is, you're trying to pee on my leg and tell me it's raining. <laughs> You know, the, <laughs> that Steve knows that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the con artist wants you to exercise faith in his claim that it's raining, but you know there's not a cloud in the sky, and the only precipitation in the area is from a small stream emanating from the vicinity of the con artist. <laughs> Along those lines, Early in my studies, I came across a speech by LDS Apostle Dallin Oaks, which was published on the farm's website. The speech was titled, The Historicity of the Book of Mormon. At that time, I was still wavering on whether the whole Mormon thing was true or not, so when I saw that title, I got excited, and I thought, well, here's an apostle and a respected attorney and state Supreme Court justice. He's going to talk about some of the historical evidence that those nasty anti-Mormons say doesn't exist. But when I read the speech, I was sadly disappointed. There wasn't a single word of historicity in the entire speech. Instead, it read more like a lawyer's plea to a jury to exercise reasonable doubt in a case wherein the facts were overwhelmingly against his client, his client being the Book of Mormon. To quote from Mr. Oak's speech, you know, the church spies here, I heard they have these lawyers get me on copyright violations. In this message, I have offered some thoughts on about a half dozen matters relating to the historicity of the Book of Mormon. Well, actually, he didn't state a single fact concerning the Book of Mormon's historicity, only his thoughts. Then he said, On this subject, as on so many others involving our faith and theology, it is important to rely on faith and revelation as well as scholarship. I am convinced that secular evidence can neither prove nor disprove the authenticity of the Book of Mormon. Those who deny the historicity of the Book of Mormon have the difficult task of trying to prove a negative. Upon reading this, my first thought was, oh, wait a minute here. He said he was going to talk about the historicity of the Book of Mormon, but now he's saying that you have to rely on faith and revelation to prove the authenticity of a supposedly historical document. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Oaks, either the Book of Mormon is authentic history or it isn't. One shouldn't have to rely on faith or revelation to know if the Book of Mormon is authentic history any more than you should have to rely on faith or revelation to know that the Romans invaded Britain or that King Tut was fond of gold. 
historical items should be able to be verified by historical and or physical evidence. Also, Mr. Roke's comments about proving a negative were actually the opposite of the way that principle operates. He asserted that it's up to those who deny the historicity of the Book of Mormon to prove that it isn't true. To the contrary, the burden of proof of the authenticity of the Book of Mormon is on, is on its advocators rather than on its detractors. So he's even a bad lawyer. <laughs> Mr. Oakes also stated, Honest investigators will conclude that there are so many evidences that the Book of Mormon is an ancient text that they cannot confidently confidently resolve the question against its authenticity despite some unanswered questions that seem to support the negative determination. In that circumstance, the proponents of the Book of Mormon can settle for a draw or a hung jury on the question of historicity and take a continuance until the controversy can be retried in another form. Now, did you get that? Oakes boasted that there are many evidences that the Book of Mormon is an ancient text, but he neglected to mention a single one of them. And then he sums up his argument by declaring that the debate over the Book of Mormon's authenticity is a draw or a hung jury. Of course, Oakes' remarks were nothing more than doublespeak, which lawyers and politicians are expert at. He wants you to think that he's saying something of substance when he really isn't. In contrast to Dallin Oakes' call to rely on faith, I came across some comments from two other Mormon apologists which unwittingly undermine the Book of Mormon's case. The first is from John Sorensen. There are those who say, I believe that doctrine is all that is important in the Book of Mormon. We do not need to worry about its history. We are faced, however, with the fact that most of the Book of Mormon is history. The history is a convincer of the authenticity of the book as much as the doctrine is. Well, the problem with your comment, Mr. Sorson, is that there isn't any history of the Book of Mormon to convince anyone of its truthfulness. I've read Sorensen's books and they're sorely lacking in any actual demonstrable evidence, as I'm sure many others of you have. The second quote is one from uh, Robert L. Millett. The historicity of the Book of Mormon is crucial. We cannot exercise faith in that which is untrue, nor can doctrinal fiction have normative value in our lives. Uh, perhaps Dallin Oaks should call those two brethren in for a little heart-to-heart -heart talk because they're contradicting his arguments, although they are more truthful. Another pro-Mormon article I read which helped to doom the Book of Mormon's authenticity in my mind was by apologist William Hamblin, also on the farm's website. This article discussed the controversy over the Book of Mormon's geography. The one detail in this article that really influenced me was where Hamlin quoted another scholar's statement that about 55% of all the geographical sites mentioned in the Bible had been located and identified. Conversely, not a single geographical site <clears throat> exclusive to the Book of Mormon has been discovered nor identified. Several Mormon apologists have provided hypothetical locations and rough maps based on the text of the Book of Mormon, but none of those have been tied to any actual physical locations. The best that the apologists can give us is vague parallels and interesting possibilities. One of the diehard apologists on the ARM who claims to be a seminary principal once boldly proclaimed that there was more evidence for the Book of Mormon than there is for the Bible. When I asked him to share his evidence, he replied, he replied with the testimony of the three witnesses. <laughs> I should have known better than to expect him to show some actual evidence. By the way, does anybody know the difference between Joseph Smith and Elvis? You can actually see Elvis's goal records. <laughs> <laughs> As I've written many times on the ex-Mormon group and ARM, the Book of Mormon provides specific details about the cultural aspects of its claimed inhabitants and specific population figures of those inhabitants in specific times. The Book of Mormon claims that some 230,000 light-skinned, Hebrew-descended, Christ-worshipping, horse-training, chariot-pulling Nephites were wiped out by the dark-skinned, savage Lamanites about 400 A.D., all in one general location. But the fact is that beginning with John Lloyd Stevens 
explorations in Central America and the publications of his travels there in 1842. And with all the numerous archaeological explorations since that time till today, there still isn't any physical evidence to prove that those people and cultures existed anywhere in the Americas in the numbers and time frames that the Book of Mormon claims they did. And I submit that the day has long passed wherein solid evidence for it should have been found. There simply isn't any good reason why archaeologists have been able to find 55% of all sites mentioned in the Bible, yet not a single one for the Book of Mormon. Of course, this lack of physical evidence is exactly why Mormon leaders and apologists have begun to, have begun to downplay a physical evidence and start in emphasizing textual evidence or spiritual evidence instead. Uh, in 1978, the Church News carried an article which discouraged readers from even studying about geographical evidence for the Book of Mormon. This, I got this from Sanders, uh, Gerald Sanders' Shadow Reality. The geography of the Book of Mormon has intrigued some readers of that volume ever since its publication. But why worry about it? To guess where Zarahemla stood can in no wise add to anyone's faith. But to raise doubts in people's minds about the location is most certainly harmful. And who has the right to raise doubts in anyone's mind? Our position is to build faith, not weaken it. And theories concerning the geography of the Book of Mormon can most certainly undermine faith if allowed to run rampant. Why not leave hidden the things that the Lord has hidden? If He wants the geography of the Book of Mormon revealed, He will do so through His prophet. Here again, church leaders ask their flock to ignore the lack of facts and rely on faith. Unfortunately, when church leaders admit, as they do here, that there is no physical evidence to prove the Book of Mormon, they're in effect admitting that their entire belief system is in the same category as other beliefs which, for which exists no physical proof, such as belief in UFOs, Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, Scientology, the Heaven's Gate cult, etc. If anybody here is in any of those belief systems, I, and I, I'm sorry. I don't guess there'd be any Heaven's Gators here. <laughs> Yeah, most Mormons would be upset if you compared the evidence for the Book of Mormon to those beliefs, but painful as it is to hear, the comparison is valid. I like to get the ARM guys, goats, saying, well, you're right in the league with Heaven's Gate. You know? you know, Mormon leaders and apologists have a perfect right to exist in that category if they so desire, but unfortunately they're terribly hypocritical in doing so. To explain... When I first began posting on ARM about five years ago, it was routine for the pro-Mormon debaters there to call for references and quotes for all the claims or statements that anti-Mormons would make. As I studied and learned more, I became more able to provide those references and quotes to the point of after a couple of years, most of the Mormons stopped demanding references and quotes, in part, I suspect, because they grew tired of me providing. <laughs> there is a lot of truth in that, right? Yeah. I have to admit. Yeah. You never see. Call for references, sites, please. I used that line a few times too early on. On me. Yeah. You learned, did you? learned. I, I did. <laughs> I think Woody calls them uh, volcanic eruptions now. Yeah. He, he, he doesn't want you to document anything because. One one apologist on ARM, ARM calls my post rants. And a couple of weeks ago, I, I said, let the record show that this man calls my documentation from historical scholarly sources. A rant. <laughs> no, Kerry shirts disappeared a couple years ago, and I sure no didn't. <laughs> uh, many of the Mormons who constantly demanded those references when I began posting there have unsubscribed. Only a handful are left. Most of those who remain have changed their tactics to where. They no longer call for references. Instead, they question the credibility of the sources or the authoritativeness or the interpretation of the data. But their hypocrisy is demonstrated by the fact that when we anti-Mormons ask them to provide references for their assertions, they respond with something like, you have to take it on faith or you need to pray for the Holy Ghost to reveal that to you. In other words, the Mormon apologists hold the statements and claims of anti-Mormons to a different standard of provenance than they do the statements and claims of Mormon leaders and writers. 
As an example of this, some of the apologists attacked Fawn Brody's credibility and scholarship by criticizing her methodology or motives or conclusions rather than the actual facts she presented. In all my years on ARM, I've only come across one actual fact in Brody's book which an apologist attacked, which was an apparent trivial error concerning the date of the trip Joseph Smith took. The triviality of the mistake and the undue import the apologist gave it is actually more of a testament to Brody's scholarship than it is a discreditation because such minor unintentional errors can be found in practically any work of history. But the hypocrisy comes in when an anti-Mormon brings up any one of a great number of incorrect, indefensible, or downright wacky statements of Mormon leaders, the apologist responds to something like, well, that statement was only his opinion. It wasn't official doctrine. Or the prophet is only a prophet when he's speaking as a prophet. Or we don't believe in the infallibility of the prophet. Or sometimes the defense is that the leader was misquoted by a scribe or some such similar excuse. Of course, we ex-Mormons don't expect Mormon leaders to be infallible either. But the problem is that the apologists expect the statements and claims of anti-Mormon writers to be absolutely error-free. <clears throat> and if they make any mistake, no matter how trivial, the apologists feel free to reject them wholesale as the institute director you know, as my mistake with Fanny Alger's age, which gave me the credibility of appeal zero. You know, I was worth nothing because of that, that error. But if you're a Mormon prophet and can supposedly commune with the creator of the universe on a routine basis, you can say all sorts of wacky, indefensible things, and your credibility doesn't suffer a bit in the eyes of the faithful apologists. In my opinion, Mormon apologists' use of different standards of proof for pro-Mormon Mormon claims versus anti-Mormon claims discredits all of their efforts. You have to play on a level playing field. One more comment on double standards and credibility sources. <coughs> Just a couple of weeks ago, LDS historian Dennis Lithgow wrote a scathing review of Will Bagley's Blood of the Prophets in the Deseret News. Is Will still here? No, he had to leave. I'm sorry. Uh, Lithgow alleged that over half of Bagley's sources were, quote, anti-Mormon in nature. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Lithgow, uh, exactly who determines what sources are anti-Mormon in nature, and how are such determinations made? Is there some little guy in the church office building who reviews each and every item of information concerning anything to do with Mormonism? He has two rubber stamps, one labeled pro-Mormon and the other <laughs> anti-Mormon, and he stamps them with either one or the other. Mr. Lithgow then told of one of the posters on the ex-Mormon group that, quote, I'm a historian and I believe in truthful history, and this one, Bagley's book, does not qualify. Excuse me, Mr. Lithgow, but a historian is someone who examines all of the data from all sides of the issues, and he compiles his work and draws his conclusions based on all the evidence, and not just from those sources which happen to support his agenda. A person who draws conclusions based only on those sources which agree with his predetermined biases and conclusions is not an historian, but an apologist. And of course, Mormon apologists reject all sources which reflect negatively on Mormonism's claims, rather than by whether the information is credible, verifiable, and corroborated by other accounts, which is the proper historical method. Mr. Lithgow may believe that he's a historian by Utah Mormon standards, but he isn't one by any professional standards, at least not in this hillbilly redneck plumber's opinion. <laughs> the truth is that anti-Mormon material in the eyes of apologists is actually material which hasn't yet been filtered and censored to reflect positively, positively on the church's claims. In addition to their habit of rejecting facts which do not comport with their biases, some Mormon apologists outright mistake or fabricate facts in order to maintain their faith. One recent example of this was BYU assistant history professor Catherine Dane's speech at the latest FAIR convention, which is an organization of Mormon apologists, sort of like the anti-ex-Mormon convention. <laughs> <laughs> You're a rabid anti-ex-Mormon. As reported in the Salt Lake Tribune, Mrs. Daines repeated the myth that 
19th century Mormons entered polygamy because so many Mormon men were either killed by persecutors or died on the pioneer <laughs> trail west for one cause or another, which created a shortage of men and left a lot of widows and single women who needed husbands to care for their families. Contrasting with Ms. Dane's assertions, well, in the first place, it's been nearly 100 years since LDS Apostle John A. Widso debunked the myth that there was ever a shortage of men in 19th century Utah in his book, Evidences and Reconciliations. Widso cited Utah census records which showed a consistent greater number of men than women. Secondly, although it's true that a certain number of Mormon men died from various causes, well, about the same number of women died right along with them. So the proportion of males to females would have remained about the same. Thirdly, Joseph Smith's polygamy practice was supposedly a revelation from God, which Smith first began hinting at as early as 1831, long before there were any persecutions or deaths to speak of among Mormons. And fourthly, Mormon polygamy, as taught in practice, was actually a method by which higher-ranking Mormon leaders could accumulate large numbers of wives for themselves for the ostensible theological purpose of increasing the greatness of their celestial kingdoms in the hereafter. Joseph Smith himself plural married at least three dozen women, and dozens more were sealed to him by proxy after his death to become his eternal companions in the afterlife, to create spirit children with him and populate new planets. The great majority of the women Joseph Smith plural married were not widows, but were instead young, marriageable women, including several teenagers and at least 11 women who were currently married to and living with their legal husbands. Brigham Young plural 